laws, a lot of stupid alcohol laws, period. I think we'd all agree on that. Yeah. So hopefully one of these days they'll uh, we'll overturn some of those for the better. Yeah. Well, to write off, go. <laughs> write off, I'm seeing, what I'm seeing is a difference in color. Yeah. Um, so, okay, let's talk about this. We have uh, two Zinfandels here. We have the, the Carol Shelton 2006 Wild Thing Old Vine Zinfandel. Um, Mendocino County Cox Vineyard. Mm -hmm. So vineyard designate, all the fruit comes from that vineyard. Mm -hmm. All my sins are vineyard designated. Excellent. Uh, so we have that one, and this is uh, on this side. Yes. And and uh, it, it's a little bit of a lighter color. Yep. Yeah, a little, you can see more, more of a red hue, whereas this one seems like it's got more of a purple hue. Some of that's due to the low crop yield. The wild okay. thing gets two and a half tons an acre or so, and the wild, and the mungazin gets a quarter to a half a ton per acre. Wow. So we're up a lot in, more the, in concentrated. Right. Yeah. In Northern California, we're beating them with a stick on the farmers, trying to say, cut down the crop, we want lower yield so that right. we get better concentration. But most of all, you want the vine to be in balance. It's got a produce what it can support nutritionally. Yeah. Why do you call it wild thing? It's a wild yeast fermentation and uh, that means that the wild yeast that are on the skins of the grapes do the fermenting for me. Okay. So 99% of the wines made in the world these days have added yeast cultures. So we have amazingly like designer yeast, you can pick what you want it to do and a flavor profile that you're hoping it will create in the finished wine and you can guarantee that it will finish fermenting and not give you any trouble, usually, <laughs> except for the 2010 of that, um, and not have any trouble at all just by putting in a pure culture of yeast. Okay. In this case, I didn't. So it's wild a very yeast scary and a wild thing. thing, okay. Yeah, and it's very scary because this could have, during fermentation, gone south on me really quickly. It could have turned to vinegar because the wrong bugs could have gotten in there. But instead, um, I know this vineyard, it's organically grown. That's key because that means the yeasts on the skins of the grapes have not been messed with by pesticides. Right. So they're full, healthy, full-on population, and they're ready to take on those grapes and ferment them once you crush them. So we get them in the tank. I give them a little bit of nutrients just to make sure they're going to finish, but I don't have yeast. And I stand back and wait, and then, and then, and then, and then, and nails, yeah. Because in some years, it's taken as long as eight or nine days to start. Normal starting with you added yeast, maybe a day and a half, two days. Right. This is eight or nine days. Rolling the dice. Yes. Rolling the dice. But the benefit is that I get really creaminess in the mouth. A little mm. more complexity in the nose. It kind of amps up the fruit a little bit, boosts it up. Gives it some compounds that it wouldn't have had if it was kind of fermented with a one-dimensional single culture of yeast. Right, right. And this is a population. This is a party. It's a party in the glass. All right. So, well, let's, let's, let's try. Try this. So, I was smelling um, uh, milk chocolate. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. yeah, definitely. This is even milkier. This has got kind of a little, almost a mix, like um, somebody streaked a little bit of milk through dark or something like that. But it's got a lot of chocolatiness, a little smokiness, and okay. um, some really bright black raspberry fruit. And so I'm getting, um, and I want to be able to describe this because a lot of our, our, our viewers are folks that are trying to educate themselves as well. Um, it sort of um, envelops my mouth and it has a little bit of um, what I think I've learned is, is tannin, mm -hmm. right? And yep. so how would you describe um, if somebody was to, to, to know at home and they're drinking a wine as compared to another wine, how would you describe that to them? What, what, what are they looking for when something is, has a high tannin or, or a low tannin or a well-structured tannin? Okay. Um, very high tannin. Tannin comes from tanning, like tanning leather. Okay. So think of your cheeks, the inside of your cheeks, that tissue in the inside of your mouth, as a piece of leather. Okay. If you add tannin to it, it gets soft and puckery. That's okay. what happens in the inside of your mouth. It kind of, okay. you feel this kind of puckering um, to the flesh. Not a, not a sour sensation, but a little sh drying sensation or a little bit of a puckering. So we could use this to tan leather if it has a little bit of extra tannin in it. But we won't. We no, 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 no. So, 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 so um, humor me a little bit here. I, I, and so the levels of tannin, I think cabs are really well known for, for fairly Big high tannins, tannins typically. Yeah. So I, I felt a little bit of that as compared to the... Uh, Coquille Blanc, Coquille, Coquille, yeah. Coquille Blanc. Um, I, I felt a little bit of it, but it kind of went away. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't. This would be more of a light, tan, but well structured tan. I'm guessing. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's enough to go. give it ageability. An 06 Zinfandel that we're tasting in the beginning of 2011 is um, that pe some people could say, "Oh God, that's really old." It's not old at all. No. My no. 2000 of this vineyard in this style of making wine is still tasting fine. 
I actually so prefer older vintages myself. They, uh, it always seems that they have just so much more character, um, mm -hmm. and 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 yet softer. They mm -hmm. they've they've softened up, mm -hmm. like you and I as we grow older. Character. Of course, adversity builds character too. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we, we, this wild thing has had some adversity too. Yes, well, it's uh, mm. very easy to drink and very easy with food. So now, help me describe the, the flavor profile of this. How would you describe this? I'm. I get a little black uh, black cherry to black raspberry. Okay. And so black fruits fruit, in general. Yeah, black fruits in general, and some nice black pepper kick, um, and some smokiness. That when you're putting this with food, something like a chipotle seasoning or something like um, uh, grilled foods, anything straight off the grill, even if it's fish, people say red wine with fish is a no-no. Bullshit. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. We can pass. <laughs> Bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it goes really well with ahi, for instance. In the case of wine and food pairing, it so much depends not on what the protein is, what the actual type of fish versus chicken versus pork versus beef, right. but the sauce and the way it's prepared. The way it's prepared. So okay. if you grill it, you're going to get lots of smoky flavors that will enhance this wine's compatibility. Right. And in addition, you put something like a mushroom sauce on it. Boom, you got a red wine with fish that works. Okay. So if you put a delicate beurre blanc on something that's going to be, or maybe even a lemon sauce, that's going to make these wines taste very sour. So you don't want to put that kind of a red wine, that kind of a sauce with red wine. In this case, you could do a, a halibut with a porcini mushroom sauce or ahi tuna, maybe even made into a tartare. That's what I do at home. Um, that will go really well. Seared lightly even. Oh, really, really good. Salmon. That sounds delicious. Yeah. And we haven't had lunch yet, and here she is talking about this. <laughs> Um, so another thing I noticed is it's it's um, Zinfandels. Uh, there's there's two trains of thoughts. They're 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 either seem like they're either jammy, mm -hmm. like blackberry jam on your on your tongue, or or on the lighter side. And this this I really like. It's got a nice body, but it's lighter. Mm -hmm. I think that's really cool because it seems like it's going to go with a lot more things. Exactly, and it has an friendly. acidity to stand up to that. That acid means the tartness. That you feel at the very tip of your tongue, very sides. Just like a lemon or something like that. So exactly. we're talking about acidity, we refer to that. Yeah, okay. and that will help it go with things like pasta sauce because tomatoes are brutal with wine because they have so much acid. Yeah. Unless maybe in the middle of the summer when they're really, 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 really sweet, but that's a short window. So the rest of the year you get your canned tomato sauce and it's got a lot of acidity and it takes a wine with enough acid to stand up to that. Okay. And too many wines, in my opinion, especially Zinfandels, are, they cheapen out. They sweeten them up too much, so then there's not enough acid not because fast. sugar and acid balance each other. So while you might have had some reasonable acidity, you jacked up the sugar, and now you don't feel the acidity and it right. feels too low. So that doesn't work. Um, but also they have, they're trying to cover things with the sugar, so right. they're covering excess alcohol, they're covering excess tannin. The imbalance of, their, of, their, of exactly. what they did either in the growing or in the process of yeah. winemaking. You need to dial it in so that it doesn't have to happen. I think something of note here would be that um, Carol was talking about she was pulling the flavor profiles out of the wine and pairing them with it. So it wasn't trying to do do something opposite. It was actually trying to something that would enhance. So the smokiness in here with the grilled foods, because mm -hmm. they're going to enhance each other. Yeah. Um, and then another thing you said, uh, gosh, you said the smokiness. And then you said the acid in here would stand up to maybe a tomato sauce, a pizza, like a pepperoni pizza maybe. Yeah. It would be really nice. Yeah. Ooh, that sounds good for lunch too. Even a grilled um, salmon, a smoked salmon pizza. Have you ever had that? Smoked salmon pizza. Put a little okay. bit of a creme fraiche down on the crust. Something like that, a little bit light, light, creamy sauce. It's a little tangy, and so there's no tomato. You just put down almost like um like salmon and lox, uh, cream cheese and salmon. You okay, know? Yeah, yeah, But you do lay down the, the creme fraiche or a little cream cheese if you don't have it, and then smoked salmon and a little capers over the top, and maybe some sliced a red onion. Squeeze of a lemon too. Yeah. We we did that actually. We used to I used to make pizzas. My wife and I we used to make pizzas up at the Marquis Lodge. Oh yeah. Yeah, and so uh, we, we actually had a smoked salmon with creme fresh pizza. Yeah, and this would go really well with it because it's smoky enough. It would go probably better with the rosé that comes from the same vineyard. I make a dry rosé of Carignan mm. that lends itself to smoked salmon like a heartbeat. That's that not sounds a good question. But for red wine with fish, that works. <laughs> well, Wild Thing's got a lot of uh, a lot of attention here. Um, the Wild Thing uh, Zinfandel retails, what's the retail price on this? $24. $24 for, oh my gosh, $24? Really? <laughs> this is just the best value Zinfandel that I can even imagine. It's even a shame saying value. I mean, your wines are just, oh my gosh, this should be like in museum. <laughs>